Hey guys, I'm JW Weatherman, and I want to give you the lowdown on a project I created, Cypherpunk University. Cypherpunk University came about after I got sick and tired of seeing all the scams in the cryptocurrency space. I realized that none of these scams would exist if people understood the foundational economic principles behind wealth creation. So I distilled my 20 years of experience in the Silicon Valley startup space and my studies of Austrian economics to give people all the tools they need to understand how wealth is actually created and also how to avoid all the scams in crypto and finance in general. In this course, you're gonna get three hours worth of content covering all the logic behind wealth creation, an hour of my time where you and I can speak live about any questions that's on your mind, access to Cypherpunk University Forum where you can network with other intelligent people, and it's just a really good time. This course will destroy all the fallacies that keep people from the only effective path to creating wealth. It will transform anyone from dumb money into smart money. So go check it out now at jwweatherman.com forward slash class. Become a beast. jwweatherman.com forward slash class. Is your child defiant, independent, annoyingly inquisitive? After a long, hard day of following the rules, who wants to deal with troublesome kids? 49% of children suffer from Oppositional Defiant Disorder, or ODD. Symptoms of ODD include independent thought, rampant creativity, and failure to submit to authority. But now there's a solution. The good people at Pilfer can help you with their time-release, once-daily capsule, Compliacin. Your child won't be able to form his own opinions, let alone express them. It maintains your child's ability to go to a state-run school and perform simple tasks around the house. You won't have to worry about parenting, and the school won't have to deal with your kid asking questions. Compliacin. You'll go from this. Quit telling me what to do! Quit telling me what to do! Quit telling me what to do! To this. Good morning, Mother. I love going to school, and this week we're learning all about how the government is our federal family and they're here to help us. Compliacin. Talk to your school psychiatrist and ask for it by name. Hello everybody, and welcome to Peaceful Anarchism on the Voluntary Virtues Network on theconsciousresistance.com and swellpodcast.org. So today I have J.W. Weatherman coming in from Silicon Valley. He's a cypherpunk, crypto anarchist, voluntarist, and agorist. And he's the programmer of the website uh, mathbot.com. And, and you can also find his, um, his podcast, J.W. Weatherman uh, Bitcoin Show, and look for that on any um, podcatcher apps. And you'll probably find it. I think he's also on YouTube, right? Same name, J.W. Weatherman Bitcoin Show. Yeah, yeah, that'll that'll bring it right up. Same name, yeah. Um, and and so yeah, we're gonna discuss um, how he became a cypherpunk and a crypto anarchist, and why he created Mathbot, and uh, and why it is challenging the government schooling system, and um, and why he's targeting it to homeschoolers and unschoolers. So um, so yeah, looking forward to getting to all that. So yeah, J.W., thanks a lot for coming on the show. Yeah, absolutely, man. Thanks for having me. This will be fun. Yeah, I heard about you uh, first on the Tom Woods show recently, and um, like many people, I uh, who have you know <laughs> homeschooling uh, their kids, I uh, checked it out, and uh, I checked it out with my eight year old son who loves um, he loves programming, he loves math, he loves chess. Um, you know, he's uh, he's that kind of kid, and so and so he loved it. <laughs> he really enjoyed it, and so. Yeah, looking awesome. forward to hearing um, or looking forward to seeing it improve. I, I, I know you know it's, it does have some bugs as as any any program and you know website does in the beginning stages. You know it's it's not easy to create something from scratch. You know. <laughs> yep. Yep. Definitely. Totally. Which he's learning, by the way, about programming and how intricate you know how you have to how you have to attend to every single detail. Um, and yeah, so so we have. I mean, there's a couple of apps. I'm, I'm, I don't know if you're familiar with Scratch Junior. Scratch. Oh yeah. Yeah, that kind of stuff. Yeah, good stuff. Uh, um, yeah, there, I mean, there's other there's other stuff too, but uh, yeah. So so yeah, he's learning about that. So he's he's appreciating, you know, what it takes to be a programmer and to to create something from scratch. So, so yeah. yeah, excellent, man. Good and, deal. And I'm also trying to, um, you know, encourage entrepreneurship. You know, you know, saying you know maybe you can make money. Like like you know, kid, every every kid wants you know their parent to buy something. But then they have to understand that that money is scarce, right? And and you have to actually earn it by creating value, right? You know, giving people what they want, satisfying people's needs and desires, 
and uh and that's how you make money and you know maybe you know telling him uh i told him a couple of times maybe you can make an app maybe you can make it because he likes video games too right maybe you can make a game that people like so <laughs> right yeah 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 absolutely um i, w- I was uh just talking to my 14 year old uh son and I'm, I'm doing an interview with him soon because he's been homeschooled and uh he's a software programmer now that's working on mathbot uh as well um i'm actually not writing any of the code on mathbot these days uh my son is and oh, wow. uh, there's Cool. There, there's other open source contributors um, that are working on it. I designed it and and got it off the ground, but uh, but at this point, there's much better programmers than me that are working on it, including my son. Um, wow. And uh, so yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna talk to him in a few days. And one of the things that um, uh, I, I tweeted out uh, on Twitter, you know, just asking what kind of questions should I ask him. And uh, one of the questions was something along the lines of how you know do, do you feel prepared uh, to, you know, be an adult, uh, <laughs> or how, how it was, it was something along the lines of how, how are you going? Do you feel like you can survive in the world? You know, something along those lines. And, uh, so I was sitting around at dinner and, you know, looking at Twitter instead of talking to my family, like I should have been, but, uh, <laughs> that, that, that popped up. So I asked them, I asked him, you know, in, in front of my wife, uh, and he was like, Oh yeah, what are you talking about? I, 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 I know how to write code. I know I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna have any trouble. <laughs> Uh, so he's, he's pretty confident, maybe a little too confident, but, um, <laughs> but yeah, I mean, what a, what a weird world to be a 14 year old and, uh, know that you have a skill set that is so in demand that there's no question that you'll be able to take care of yourself and your family. Exactly. I mean, I mean, I'm sure we'll get into this, but, uh, government schooling is so antiquated. You know, the idea that you have to go to a place, sit in a chair, open a book and look at the teacher and regurgitate what they want is to see on the test. And that's what education, and that's what you're going to need in like 20 years <laughs> right. when you're out in the real world is amazing. <laughs> yeah. 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 I think, I think their, their, their best angle there is um, that, you know, everybody's a drone and you want to be you want to be a drone like everybody else because that's how you'll be successful. <laughs> and I think that uh, that story is getting really, really long in the tooth at this point. Hmm. Um, but that's I honestly think that's what's behind the fear, the socialization fear. Um, you know, if you homeschool your kid, and one of the first things that anybody is going to say, you just walk up to somebody in the grocery store and say, "Hey, I've never met you before. I homeschool my kid." They're going to go, "Oh, socialization! Oh my God, socialization!" <laughs> um, and I think right. the I think the, the the fear behind that is like, "Oh, they might be different. They might be weird," mm. because all of the other sheep have been ushered through the system that just crushes their spirit, makes them feel dumb, depressed, weird. Um, and all those sort of things. And your kid might not be like that. So how is he going to get along with all these, uh, with all these degenerates? Um, you know, when he's in corporate America in 15 years, uh, on the verge of suicide, you know, is he going to be like everybody else? Um, so I think, I think that's the, uh, that's probably the best angle that they have at this point is that, yeah, you'll have a miserable life and a miserable existence, but you know, it would be part of the herd. Um, they should put that on the school crest at this point, I think. I'm gonna I'm gonna quote you on that dumb degenerate depressed say J W not tell me what you really think no <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah exactly <laughs> yeah in uh, in other words yes <laughs> that's right. exactly what happens and uh, you know people like my my parents especially my mother would often say you know how could you talk bad about about government school or public school, you know, you went through it and look where you are today. You're a successful person. You know, you have a beautiful wife and kids and you got, you know, you're an acupuncturist and an herbalist and you, you know, you worked um, in a job for a couple of years and, you know, what's wrong? What do you have to complain about? <laughs> yeah. and my, my response is always like, um, if a person was um, abused as a child, like let's say physically abused, and yet they grew up to be a successful, um, you know, adult or, or, or business person, would you say, look at that, you got abused yeah. and you became successful. How could you complain hey. about that? <laughs> right, right, exactly. Because the sewer, you know, if you, if you drag yourself through the sewer and somehow manage to get out of it, uh, you need to look on the sewer with gratitude. <laughs> no, I, I, don't, I don't think so. Um, yeah, yeah, it's a, you know, and the, the other thing I would say is that 
you know, you and I are older. Um, I'm in my mid forties. Uh, I, I, I know that, uh, schools as bad as they were and they were bad, like they, they were not great. Not very many of us, uh, even if you went to a decent private school or a public school came out more than semi-literate. Uh, very few of us statistically had read a couple books and very few of us after in our generation, after graduation, ever pick up a book uh, out of pleasure or out of just a desire to learn. Mm. Um, many of us do, you know, our generation will pick up books um, if it's required for work, you know, if we're kind of forced into it, which is exactly what we were trained to do in school. But now it is so much worse. Uh, the stuff that kids are being subjected to now uh, is five, ten times worse in my view than anything that we got subjected to. Mm. And for me, because I'm, I'm a math nerd, um, one of the best examples of that is the way that they teach math. Uh, we got a terrible version of math, made us hate math. Mm. They get a version of math that makes you just absolutely convinced that math is the worst creation that's ever come into existence. It doesn't make sense. Uh, it's illogical. It's irrational. It's just complete pain. Uh, and so, I mean, like we filled out a form for the DMV and, and we thought that was math. These kids are filling out a form for the DMV that asks questions that don't even make sense, that ask them six times, that make you go through this crazy procedure. I mean, mm. what, what Common Core has done to the really terrible version of math that we experienced in government schools is uh, is really just impressive, actually. It's really something to behold. I think uh, – go ahead. Oh, I, th that was it. Oh, that was um, it. Just, it's, it's just uh, – it's just – it, it's really a very spectacularly evil thing that they've done to math. And this has only happened in like the last five, six years. Um, it was rolled out nationwide without any pilot, without any testing. They never said, hey, we're going to subject 100, and, 100 million kids you know, over the next several years to this completely new way of teaching math, this whole new way of thinking about math, uh, this whole new concept. We're going to do this to 100 million people. Let's try it on 30 and see how it goes. They did not do that. They came up with this crazy idea and they rolled it out. And uh, it is it's it's truly miserable and awful. And uh, if if I was, you know, sitting in a back room, smoking cigars, sacrificing babies, trying to come up with the <laughs> best way to just make a whole generation of people hate reason and logic. I could not do better than what they've done with common core for math. It is, it's spot on. It's perfect. I think uh, one of the best phrases to encapsulate um, what they're teaching in school is called, it's just called it government math. I think that's, <laughs> that's a simple way to say, it. what yeah. does government do? That's ever uh, efficient, useful, effective, um, and good, <laughs> you know, and, and, uh, you know, um, spends money wisely. Like, like, is there, is there such a thing? No, of course not. And, and yep. so I think, I think just, just saying that, like once, once the state takes hold of something, you know, it just, it, it just becomes, you know, wicked and corrupted and wretched and, you know, and decrepit and, and, <laughs> and, it, and it's so unfortunate that, like you said, it's getting worse, you know? Um, like, I mean, I don't think I, I remember, I don't think I remember actually really hating math, but, um, I don't know, maybe I'm different because I, I'm a, I'm a big chess player also. Um, so, uh, you know, some people say there's a link or not, I don't know, but, um, and I'm also a big piano player. So, you know, I don't know if that <laughs> has any yeah. relation, um, but, um, but yeah, so logic really, to me, I love that kind of stuff. Logic, um, puzzles, logic games, you know, um, you know, programming type, um, uh, activities that, you know, I really, really enjoy that. So, yeah. uh, so yeah, so it's go ahead. Yeah. I, I mean, there, there's always been a small percentage of us that could rise above, right. Where, where the government wonk puts a DMV form in front of us and we can see past it and sort of see that there is logic and reason and beauty going on there. And as much as they try to crush our spirit, um, we can fill out those forms pretty quickly and then glean what's actually interesting, right? We can, mm. we can do something with Pythagorean's theorem and they'll make us do it 278 freaking times <laughs> with very slight variations, <laughs> but we have the endurance. We can just push through that nonsense 
And then it's at the same time go, wow, Pythagorean's theorem is pretty cool. So there's always been a small number of us that can that can do that. Yeah. Uh, what they're doing now is even is going to shrink that number of people even smaller. Hmm. Um, but yeah, I mean, it, it ultimately, if you can pierce through the veil of uh, bureaucracy and nonsense, math is beautiful. It's just logic and reason um, and, you know, a- exploration of how the universe fits together. Like what what could be more appealing and interesting to the human mind than that. Uh, mm-hmm. That's all we do. Like from the time that we wake up to the time that we go to sleep, we're trying to understand ourselves or trying to stand, understand other people, nature, y- you know, we're all obsessed with politics cause we want to know how the world works. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, the idea that there's a subset of people that are interested in logic and reason and exploring, you know, shapes and, uh, um, you know, functions, things like that. It's, it, it, it's only an idea that I believe is uh, based in uh, what we've experienced, where we've 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 been subjected to something that's miserable, and a small percentage of us can put up with it. And because we're told that that miserable thing is math, we believe a small percentage of people are good at math. Uh, but it's not. It's a small percentage of people that are willing to put up with just this wretched experience and still pull the light out of it at the end of the day. Right. Um, and one, one of the ways that I, I, I think that is most damning of government schools is if you just, if you realize one thing about math, you'll realize that government schools, even in our generation, from the time that they started, they've never taught math because math is exploring logic and reason and doing problem solving. Hmm. And you and I never experienced problem solving. They never put a problem in front of us and said, this is a, this is a conundrum. I want you to think about how you would go about solving that. Not once if from the, you know, anybody that's in their mid forties and younger, they were only presented with a process and a procedure that if you blindly follow this process and procedure, it's like a sausage factory, you know, throw chunks of meat in, crank the thing, sausage come out. <laughs> you have no, it is absolutely just following a procedure. So you don't get, you don't get the chemical rewards. You don't mm. get the pleasure. You don't get what we're, we're hardwired to explore a problem. And if we solve it, uh, we, we get a dopamine hit, right? Mm. We, so the idea that we could all have the same meat brain that rewards us as soon as we solve a problem, but only some of us actually enjoy solving problems, it, it's completely irrational. Uh, but what they did to us is they they reduced that dopamine hit. They re- reduced that reward drastically by never really letting us problem solve. But what they're doing to the new generation is taking that concept and kicking it up uh, on steroids. So now – you, you have to learn four or five different procedures to solve the same problem. And the procedures, at least the procedures that they subjected us to were uh, reasonable, right? They were, they were shortcuts and it was a lot of crap and it was a lot of carry the one stuff, which is completely optional. That's not math. That's a particular trick. That's fine. You can learn the tricks. But what you really want to do is you want to learn the problem and explore the space and come up with a solution and then, you know, maybe pick up some tricks to make it easier next time, whatever. That's fine. We were only shown tricks and how to do them in sequence. They're shown tricks that are stupid. Um, when, When we were told to carry the one, it made sense. They're told that when they do five plus four, they're going to do something stupid like have you add five plus two like it, it's it's necessary. It's not rational and logical. It's just more detailed process and procedure that I think it's actually intentional that it's not logical because they really want you to hate it. Because otherwise, I can't imagine why they would do this sort of stuff. It's it just doesn't make sense. Yeah, my um, yeah, my son is eight, and um, I, I clearly see that he's has um, you know, he's very his mind understands math. Um, much better than my daughter um she's six and um but i don't think that's just an age thing you know like there's a lot of things that she does better than him you know like uh more physical things actually she's more physically developed coordination balance that kind of thing gymnastics ballet dancing (laughs) um that she does better than him but but with the intellectual stuff um math and chess he understands a lot better a lot clearer and and he actually uh, surprises me you know what kind of math he can do in his head <clears throat> um so and also you know he doesn't hate it <laughs> which is wonderful yeah. you know like like uh, there's you know there's math everywhere and uh, and and also I was telling my wife recently that um 
one of the best ways that you can teach your kids um, uh, math and counting is to give them um, like an allowance, give them, you know, or maybe money for some small tasks. And then they slowly have their own money. They're going to learn math because they're going to be constantly counting their money. <laughs> like my son knows exactly how much money he has. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, I mean, the, another another thing that is really uh, a good idea is to reward kids. Yeah. So this is something that the government schools have done studies that's all over the place. If you if you present a problem to a kid and you say, if you master this subject, I'll give you fifty dollars, um, they will master it uh, at at a much higher rate than if they if you don't give them any reward. And that shouldn't be surprising to us because I don't I don't design stuff, I don't build stuff and write code and do all the work that I do, do security research, all that sort of stuff, just for the love of it. Mm. I mean, I do like it, but I also like being uh, acknowledged, I like public praise, and I like money because I can buy stuff with it. <laughs> and it, kids are not stupid. Mm. So so if you, uh, if you reward them when they do good, um, including financial rewards, they do more of that. Um, now, of course, the government schools have had to come up with a ridiculous story. I mean, it's always a ridiculous story, right? But this one is one of the most ridiculous. And it's it, it reminds me of the, oh, you shouldn't homeschool your kids because of socialization thing. Uh, <laughs> and it's, and it's absolute <laughs> lunacy. But what they've said is, like, we, we don't want to do that. Yes, we spend ten, twelve, fifteen thousand dollars $15,000 a year per kid uh, in government school, and we know that if we give them fifty dollars for every A, their their test scores go way way up, right? Um, and so for five hundred dollars, we can we can have a huge impact. We know that. But here's the thing, citizen: um, if we do that, it will crush their love of learning because if they work and learn for rewards, well, then they'll never know what it's like to learn just for the pure joy of learning. Right. <laughs> is that the most like Orwellian evil thing you've ever heard? Of? <laughs> but but I mean, it's what's sad is that that has affected even a lot of homeschoolers that I talk to. Like that piece of propaganda is so effective that it really has seeped into the culture in America pretty aggressively. I reward, you know, I mean, I have rewarded my son a lot for for doing difficult problems. Mm. Um, and he loves he still loves working on difficult problems. He just loves also getting rewarded for it. So mm -hmm. um, I, and I think, you know, that's going to be a very natural transition into his, his career as a program or whatever else he goes on to do, because because that's how the world works. Right. We, we only want to solve problems because we want to get rewarded. Like right. I'll solve my own problems for a reward, uh, but I might solve your problems for a reward, too. Right. Uh, but I'm not going to just sit around all day just, you know, in my garage, you know, like a <laughs> like an idiot savant just drawing on the walls, just having a great time. I don't I don't know what these people think they're producing, but they're not producing that. <laughs> um, what, uh, you made me think of something. Um, oh, yeah. The idea when people tell me I sometimes I bribe my kids to do things and and I tell them I don't like the word bribe because it has such a negative connotation. But the idea, what you what you said, reward for doing a difficult task, I like that. <laughs> to me, bribery is associated with you know government and right. corruption and that kind of thing. Exactly. But, but but also just giving an incentive for your children to act in a certain way, um, I think is wonderful. And and that's and that's exactly what we do. You know, when we work at a job, you know, we get paid. You know, no, who would work for free? I mean, very few people. <laughs> Maybe there are some people, but most people, when they work, they want to get compensated, right? They want to get paid, and that's an incentive to to work hard and be efficient and 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 do good work and be productive, right? And um and and I think that's completely natural, completely human, right? Um, go ahead, go ahead. Yeah, yeah, totally. I mean, it's those are the sort of subtle things that uh, leftists and government propagandists always do. They 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 will take something and they'll they'll use an opposite word for it. So you're you're right to hit on that, right? You're not bribing your kid. If you look up the definition of bribery, the reason that it has a negative connotation is that it's a payoff, right? It's paying somebody to do something dirty, mm, right? You're right, you're bribing right. a judge. You right. bribe a judge. You bribe a policeman. Yeah. You don't bribe a kid to take out the trash. <laughs> you reward a kid for being responsible and taking <laughs> right. out the trash. Uh, and you know, you know, I, I think the other the other thing I would say about that is that you're you're totally right that that is a natural transition into the workplace. But there's also this, especially when it comes to money, this weird idea that, 
um, that kids shouldn't have anything to do with money. The reason that I solve problems is I want a world that works better for me. Mm. I want either software that works that I want to use that works better, or I want to solve other people's problems in mm. exchange for them solving my problems, right? I will build software for you and your kids, but you know, you better make some milk because I like it on my cereal in the morning and we'll trade, <laughs> right? Like I have a no milk problem. You have a no software problem. Let's work something out, right? Um, so that that's natural, right? That's good. It is uh, the way that we are designed to, to function. Um, and the idea that kids don't get that, that like kids will just solve problems for the joy of it is stupid. It's not joyful to solve problems in and of itself. There's pleasure in productivity, but it's because it's solving problems. And if you have somebody, um, you know, it'd, it'd be like building a chair. And instead of saying, hey, you're going to learn how to, to cut two by fours as we build this chair. And at the end, you're going to have a chair you can sit in, right? There's an inherent reward in that because you have a place to sit now. Mm. The government is saying, no, 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 you don't want to do that. What you want to do is you want to take a two by four and just cut two inches off of it. And then just cut two inches off of it and just do that all day until you have this nice big pile of two by four. Oh, you don't love math? What's wrong with you? Well, you know, maybe we can put you in a special program. Maybe we can medicate you. Actually, you know, there's this weird side effect of this medicine that we're going to give you that also kind of turns you into a little girl if you're a little boy. But but hey, if, you know, you don't love math. We, we really need you to give you a chemical lobotomy. Um, it, it's it's absolutely insane. Are you a chess player? Uh, I have played a, a bit of chess. I'm not very good at it. Actually, my son is a pretty good chess player. <laughs> ah, did you learn? Where did you learn from? You or someone else? Friend? Uh, he did not learn from me. I'm not good enough to have taught him as well as he learned. Um, he uh, he learned from his grandfather. Because, you know, the exact reason why I love chess and, um, you know, how some people say, oh, I love word problems or I love puzzles or, um, yeah, like let's say a word problem, right? It's a, a whole big description of a situation. You got to figure out what's the solution, right? Well, to me, every single position of a chess game, you make you make a move. Well, first of all, before you make the move, that's a puzzle. What's the best move, right? Then your opponent moves, then he, you turn again. What's the best move? Every single position that you're presented with is a puzzle. You're constantly figuring out puzzles, <laughs> you know? And I find that to be very beautiful. Um, yeah. Of course, it's so Im immensely complex as well. <laughs> it's like we haven't, even, we haven't even scratched the surface of this enormous complexity that is chess. Uh, even though it's been been playing for like a couple of centuries already, but uh, but yeah, so yeah, 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 and you know, all humans enjoy problem solving. Yeah. Uh, and so if you if you do understand that math is just problem solving, then it doesn't make sense that that some of us would enjoy it and others of us wouldn't. Um, you know, I I definitely think some of us have just more of an affinity for for drawing numbers and shapes, but. Look, Einstein just sat around and thought about these problems, right? Mm -hmm. Like the, a lot of what he did was thought experiments that had nothing to do with equations. Mm -hmm. And he wasn't very good at putting equations to the thought experiments. A lot of times he had to work with somebody else to do that. But he would be able to just sit and think clearly and problem solve. No pencil, no paper, no writing involved. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, no equations, but then he could work with somebody else to, to formalize it. Um, but that is math. Um, and he was a brilliant mathematician, even though he wasn't uh, all that great at uh, putting symbols on paper. Right. Yeah. 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 When I was um, when I was in seventh grade, um, this kid who was uh, generally considered to be like kind of like an idiot savant, although he wasn't really dumb. He just didn't care what other people think of it. I thought of him. He, was, he was like, you know, a radical kid with the, you know, the ripped jeans and the you know, Metallica t-shirt, long hair, you know, he just didn't care what he looked like, but he's a genius, like really smart kid. In seventh grade, he gave me um, the book, he recommended I read the book Hyperspace by Mishu Kaku. Uh, yeah. Not, <laughs> I got, so starting in seventh grade, I got into theoretical physics and cosmology and astronomy and oh my God, it opened my eyes and I loved it. You know, I, I read that and I read Cosmos and I read, you know, uh, A Brief History in Time, Stephen Hawking. Um, and then, um, yeah, I just read a bunch of books and then, yeah, Mr. Cocker wrote a bunch more books. I read those. <laughs> so, so yeah. go, go ahead. Yeah, no, that's, that's great, man. I mean, I, I, the, the, part of the reason I'm really passionate about helping people understand that there aren't math people, there aren't people that love math and people that don't, um, is that it's going to be really hard for 
anybody to be successful uh, moving forward unless they learn how to program. Um, you don't want to you don't want to go into truck driving right now because Elon Musk and a team of developers are working on a self driving uh, semi truck. Right. Mm. Uh, you also don't want to go into being a lawyer right now. Because there's teams of developers working on creating things like smart contracts where, mm. uh, where, where there's no need for a judge because everything is automatically executed based on a set of circumstances. That's going to cut into the lawyering field quite a bit. Mm. Um, there, there are um, – even if you said, OK, I want to be a heart surgeon. Well, great. You know who is going to make a bigger impact on heart surgery than heart surgeons? It's the guys that are writing the code in the robotics mm, so that the right. heart is mapped properly so that the that I mean, most of the time at this point, robotic assisted surgery, you know, come on, it, it's it's a robot doing the surgery and a human making some decisions just because we haven't gotten around to writing that code yet. Yeah. Right. So. So every job that you can think of has an expiration date, and that expiration date is accelerating rapidly, right. except for problem solving and doing software development. And um, and that is because software development, you know, we, we are in like this new industrial revolution. This We're still in the early stages of this information technology revolution. And, you know, a lot of people are slowly getting it, right? They're, they're slowly realizing, you know what, the best thing about my pickup truck is the software in it that does all of this crazy stuff that gives me a 360 degree view uh, that automatically kicks in the uh, transmission brake and all of this other stuff so that I don't have to be a brilliant truck driver anymore. Um, and, uh, you know, it's not really the hardware, right? We've kind of had the, the eight cylinder engine figured out for a while, but we can make that feel like a freaking spaceship and solve all kinds of problems. So you can just sit back and relax in your climate controlled environment. Mm -hmm. And it's all software. Um, so, and you know, the, the, uh, the nice thing about that is that we've barely scratched the surface on all the problems that we can solve with software. It's something that if you're taught properly, it totally appeals to the human mind and it makes you super powerful. I mean, it makes you feel like a freaking wizard mm -hmm. when you can go at a problem and you can solve it. And now that it doesn't matter how big the problem is with software. You can solve the tiniest problem, but you just solved it for 7 billion people. Mm -hmm. That is incredible. It's, <laughs> it feels so good. Um, so yeah, I, I think, uh, I think it's really important that people slowly realize that, uh, Software is fun. Math is fun. They're actually synonymous. There's no difference between math and software development. If you create a function um, that takes two numbers and puts them together and you call it add, you know, ADD, yeah. or you have a piece of paper and a pencil and you have the plus symbol and you just mentally know that that plus symbol is a function that means ADD, um, it's, it's the same thing. It's just a, a, num a matter of this different symbols that you're choosing to use um, and whether you have to execute that function manually all the time um, as well. Um, but I mean, there, there really, there really isn't a difference. And even the best mathematicians now they're all software developers because uh, it, it puts a lot more power in their hands. So um, yeah, I think, uh, I think, that's one of the reasons I'm kind of optimistic. I'm also, I mean, I'm a cypherpunk, which means I'm a guy that's uh, an ANCAP, a uh, crypto anarchist, whatever, but sees a, a real turning point in the 90s when encryption leaked out of the NSA and got in the hands of uh, academics and regular people. Um, that all, many actually recognized at that point, there was a turning point, that it was inevitable that government was going to fall because the moment that we had encryption in our hands, we were going to be able to communicate freely um, with each other. You know, this whole threat of um, uh, surveillance and all of that sort of stuff, it had an expiration date that was rapidly approaching. Um, the whole concept of freedom of assembly uh, was now non-negotiable, right? We weren't going to have to negotiate with governments and hope that they were going to honor some piece of paper um, in order to give us freedom of assembly. It was inevitable. Being able to execute contracts and have conversations and exchange financial uh, instruments like Bitcoin is a is a result of this thirty plus year movement to to build this uh, digital Galt's Gulch where we could have a foothold and then bring freedom from there out to the physical space. Um, I think these guys uh, these guys have made a ton of progress, and um, I think that's where uh, that's where I see a lot of hope, and I see a lot of hope in the fact that as people learn how to write code. 
They know that there's not a distinction between code and speech. They're not going to be able to go after guys like Cody Wilson anymore and say, oh, what you're doing is illegal. We got to shut down this site. Because if you know that code is just speaking a language that's understood by computers, you get really uncomfortable when the government says you can't talk about this or you can't express those ideas. Um, and the, the empowerment of the individual is insane. I mean, uh, I, 20 years ago, I was reading, uh, uh, what was that guy? Uh, I can't remember, but there, there was this New York Times columnist that was just ranting about how um, RPGs were completely changing the game, right? You could have a, a $20 million helicopter and a $200 RPG, a rocket-propelled grenade, and they were basically on level playing field. And, you know, the New York Times, they're just, they're just weeping and gnashing their teeth in terror over this reality that the individual is getting empowered at such a rapid rate that governments are no longer going to be able to... Uh, basically exploit people uh, because it's not going to be cost effective. I think things like Bitcoin completely change the game. But the other thing that changes the game is that when people can write software, that is an RPG on steroids, right? That is like being able to create a million digital RPGs uh, at the press of a key. And uh, that's a world that is going to be very different from the world that we're in right now. Um, and it's going to come about because people are going to become just much more powerful through software. Beautiful, I love that. So, so before I, we skipped over the the uh, <laughs> the opening, but real quick, just to give people an idea, how you came um, to the idea of uh, cypherpunk and crypto anarchism, and uh, and yeah, and why you created Mathbot. Yeah, so I think I think it was I can't remember what year it was. I read a book by Ron Paul, and Ron Paul referenced uh, Ludwig von Mises. And I absolutely hated Ron Paul's book. I think he's a great guy, but I absolutely <laughs> hated his book. But this, this footnote caught my attention. And so I read Human Action uh, cover to cover, I think, three Whoa. times in a row. Whoa. I was just completely blown away. I mean, Human Action is uh, one of my favorite books of all time. It's my hmm. favorite like parenting book. It's my favorite management book. Hmm. Um, I could have I saved myself a lot of years of reading stupid leadership books had I read Human Action sooner. Wow. Uh, and it's by far my favorite economics book. Um, so that completely changed my perspective on a lot of things. Uh, and uh, eventually I found Murray Rothbard um, and, uh, and started reading his stuff. Um, I think the first thing I read by Murray Rothbard was Anatomy of the State. Uh, highly recommend that essay. It is definitely an eye opener. Um, and uh, yeah, a few years after that, actually, I sold a company. I, I'm, for about the last decade, I've been creating software startups and then uh, eventually selling them or finding a way to you know take the money and run. Um, and I had just got done doing that. Uh, this was a few years ago. Um, when my wife was helping out some, some kids and also, you know, working, we, we were, we were kind of fans of Khan Academy. Uh, I was using that a bit with my, my son when he was 11, 12 mm -hmm. and, uh, and when common core came out, Khan Academy started changing. Um, and also the kids that my wife was helping in the neighborhood learn math. Uh, they, they were going to government schools, so they needed to start learning this common core stuff. And so my wife looked into it. She, she actually majored in math in college and it is a big, big, uh, you know, uh, math nerd, I guess. Um, hmm. uh, and we were both just completely disgusted. Um, there's our anniversary dinner, uh, you know, was completely, and we we're sitting in a nice restaurant and all we did was like scream at each other. Uh, <laughs> could not, I mean, it's like finding out that, uh, that the government is abusing kids in some way that's so insidious and subtle that it, it really could result if it's, if it's not fought back and if, uh, if it's not, uh, I don't know. I mean, there, there's just something really dark and evil about making kids hate logic. I don't know what that world looks like, but those are kind of the, so on my optimistic side, I see people learning software development, uh, the rapid uh, empowerment of individuals and the defunding of government through things like Bitcoin. On my pessimistic side, I see millions of kids right now going through programs that I could not design better to make them completely hate and despise logic and reason. And I don't know what that's gonna look like. I mean, that's an experiment, like I said, they didn't try it with 30 kids so we could see what kind of monsters and hateful creatures are produced. Now they're doing it to millions of kids. And uh, and I am, I my guess is that they just, they, they, they can't do more than make people hate math. 
My guess is that they've just dialed that in better. But uh, but I, I really don't – I'm not looking forward to seeing what kind of person that produces uh, after 20 years of that sort of mental abuse. Um, so it's, it's, it, it feels like a, a much more uh, – uh, uh, I don't know. It feels more and more like there, there is a – there's a – we're either going to go really bad or really good, right? And my guess is that it's going to be both, right? Some people are going to – uh, really end up in a bad place and the suicide rate and the depression rate is going to continue to skyrocket among certain groups of people. And, uh, on, on the other hand, I think there's going to be other groups of people that are able to just fully break away from that nonsense and hopefully, you know, rescue everybody else in the long run. Yeah. Uh, you know, on, on the one hand, you're right. Like, um, it is quite depressing in, in, you know, how many people do send their kids to government schools, um, and and actually think it's necessary <laughs> to be a productive uh person in society um but you know we do what we can to improve the world and you're certainly doing quite a bit you know with this um with this program with this website and uh you know spreading the word through your podcast you know I'm I'm doing what I can through my podcast my YouTube channel my blog and everything and you know that I think that's the best we can do spread ideas you right and hopefully um you know the more people read them the more people listen um, and then they talk to their friends and, you know, the word spreads that way. Um, you know, I think that's the best way, you know, we have to, we have to use the power of our words and the power of our, the, the written word and the spoken word to, you know, convey these messages, uh, in ways that, you know, are engaging and that people would, would understand and want to, want to listen, you know, and, and, uh, you know, and, and also hopefully it will improve their lives if they do listen. Right. So that's kind of, I mean, that's my goal and I'm sure that's your goal too. You, we want to improve people's lives and help people to understand, you know, for, for I mean, um, more specifically you, you're targeting education, but I'm, you know, I, I, I also encompass a lot, a lot with my podcast, you know, in general of just, um, you know, I cover a lot of different topics, interview a lot of different people, wide variety of topics on um, basically how the state makes everything worse. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I mean, statism is absolutely the uh, the modern religion, right. and right. and it's 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 you know it's probably the worst one we've come up with so far. We're not we're not uh, you know sacrificing babies on top of a uh, you know a big pile of stones at this point, but. Mm. Uh, but we are, you know, sacrificing our kids in a lot of other slightly more subtle, but um, but certainly on a larger scale than, mm -hmm. uh, than anything the Aztecs were doing. I mean, I I don't what would be worse, uh, you know, sacrificing one baby every full moon or putting them all through government schools. <laughs> I, I think if I had to pick, I'd pick the former. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I can understand someone listening to that and like, what? JW supports Aztec human sacrifice? How is that possible? <laughs> oh, man. I, talk, I might about, talk about that. taking out of context. All right, go ahead. Sorry. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, I, I don't vote, but I might vote for that one. If, <laughs> if, it, ever, if it ever comes up on the ballot, you know, we're going to sacrifice one child per full moon, but we're going <laughs> to shut down the public schools. That's going to be a really hard box for me make, not to check. Make, um, make human but, sacrifice great again. Hey, go ahead. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, so, uh, I mean, to, to get back to the, the story of MathBot story right, that you right. asked, um, so, you know, my wife discovered that and, uh, we were both just completely outraged. And so for the, that, that basically from that point on, it was, it was more or less my obsession to try to figure out a way to, um, to teach math, uh, very much inspired by Euclid, uh, Euclid's elements is this incredible book that, um, was basically the math curriculum from before Alexander the Great to after Albert Einstein. It's incredible. Like this is how every mathematician through that huge 2000 year span of history, uh, learned mathematics. And, uh, and of course, you know, government schools immediately changed that and got away from it. But what's, what's beautiful about Euclid's elements is that he starts out by saying, okay, assume that you can draw a straight line and that you can draw a circle. And from there, he just slowly adds additional questions, additional problem spaces that you can explore to the point where you get well beyond, you know, Pythagorean's theorem um, and learn about all kinds of really interesting aspects of, of spatial reality. Um, and so I wanted to I wanted to do that, but I wanted to also. Uh, just completely blur the line and make it very clear that there isn't a difference between math and programming. Um, and so that's, that's what eventually became mathbot.com. 
Um, and so what you do is you program a robot that just moves around the screen and moves blocks. So if, if you're a homeschooler, you probably know about like math, you see, or Singapore math where it's very visual and tactile. Um, if you imagine that, except you don't touch it because you tell a robot to go pick up those objects and move them around is, is essentially what we're trying to do and, and what we are doing. Um, and, uh, yeah, I mean, the goal is it's completely free. Uh, anybody can play it. Um, the goal is to make it so easy and relatively speaking fun. Um, although it's hard problems, right? It's brain work. It's not angry birds. So we're not going to be able to compete with those guys. <laughs> uh, we're just, you know, <laughs> checking out, uh, first person shooters or whatever. Um, <laughs> but, uh, but the goal is to make it so, so relatively fun and so easy and incremental that governments just, that it's just clear to everybody that there's no need for public schools. There's no need for private schools. They can all get out of pretending to teach math because kids are going to be showing up, you know, seven, eight years old. There are going to be programming recursive functions. Their teachers aren't going to know what the hell is going on because they're, they're so much further advanced in mathematics than they are. And, and, uh, and then I think parents will realize just how, how obsolete this whole system is. So that's the goal, just to make it painfully and clearly obvious that they never were teaching math and that if you want to learn math, there's this website and it's totally free and it's, it's, uh, you know, it's easy. The, the, the Bitcoin thing came in just only about a year ago. So I, I was working on MathBot for, you know, quite a while. And the problem that I ran into, which comes back to the rewards thing, was that we started doing user testing. So I had like two to 300 kids. I put them in front of MathBot. This was about, about you know, 18 months ago, roughly. And uh, we were feeling really good about it. Um, and it was going well. The problem was that most of the kids did well when it was very, very easy. And as, even though it was just one more incremental step, as it got harder, the kids that had parents that told them that the kids that knew that they were going to be rewarded if they pulled off something impressive or if they got to a certain level, all those kids thrived and mm. they pushed through those difficulties. But we could see that the kids that didn't have that, uh, very few of them, uh, of the 300 kids that we put through this two or three, right? Two or three pushed through the, the, the challenges and actually got to the point where we wanted them to get. And so, uh, because our goal is not just to go after the kids that already have parents that are going to discover Euclid's elements, and they're going to put, you know, a more or less decent curriculum together themselves. We want to destroy public schools. We, we want to see like every public school and private school, actually, because those guys aren't much better. Like, I will know that I'm successful when I see a, a math teacher standing on the side of the street saying, we'll work for food. So <laughs> at that point, we really we were frustrated because, you know, it would be fine for the 10, 15 percent that are already going to kill it anyway. Um, but we're so we we kind of were struggling. It was it wasn't a shelf project, but it was it was a skeleton crew. I'd brought it down to just like one developer wasn't really sure what to do with it because of that problem. And then I got uh, my my original career and my background has always been in software security. So I I ended up looking at Bitcoin and got totally obsessed about that about a year ago. And that's when I realized that Bitcoin can actually solve my math bot problem. So because I want every kid in the world to learn math, um, but I need them to be rewarded to do that. And they don't always have parents that are interested or capable or have thought this things through, or maybe they're, they've been indoctrinated by the government to think rewards are bad. But the idea in MathBot um, soon, uh, it, you can't do it right now. Now it's totally free. Um, but soon you'll have the option to pay $50 for algebra, for example, and we will take $45 and give it to the kid as they pass levels. So mm -hmm. if, they're, if they're working on division, you know, 20 bucks from the parent or grandparent goes into MathBot, $18 comes out, trickled to the kid as they master new topics. Um, I think if we pull that off, which we should have that done within a few months, hmm. um, then, you know, th then there's an opportunity for charities to step in and say, okay, you know, if this inner kitty said, inner city kid masters calculus, we'll give him 200 bucks, right? It's not very much money because it's not that hard, actually. It hmm. just needs to be enough incentive to just play that next level. 
um, then I think then I think we'll be able to scale the way we want to and and, and address a lot of the kids that would otherwise be uh, be left out. And you know, it's not just the charitable aspect, but there's usually somebody in any kid's life that wants them to be really good at math, and if they can just throw fifty bucks at it and then know you know get notified when the kid crushes some linear algebra problem, uh, I think that'll be a great, great experience for everybody. Um, and that is not, I mean, th that could not happen pre Bitcoin credit mm -hmm. cards. That wouldn't be possible. Um, direct deposits, you know, whatever electronic payment methods are out there. Um, none of them would allow for that user experience until mm -hmm. Bitcoin. Wow. <laughs> Beautiful. Yeah, that, I'm looking forward to that. Definitely. Um, you know, and, and also the idea that you mentioned of, of wanting to make government schools obsolete, you know, to me, that's a wonderful way to deal with the state, you know, uh, you know, when people think anarchists are, you know, violent and want chaos and disorder, you know, I just tell people, well, you know, I want, I want the state to go the way of blockbuster. Right or right or cord phones. <laughs> you know, did we get did you get get rid of those by a rebellion and revolution and assassination? No, of course not. <laughs> you just you just evolve. You develop technologies that make it obsolete and uh, irrelevant. And, right, and that's exactly what you're doing, and that's exactly what we have to do um, to create a better world. Is just make make the next best thing, make better, make better. We're constantly making better. And and it will just be so glaringly obvious that you know the um, the government schooling system is a dinosaur. It's antiquated. It's um, ancient. <laughs> it's it's an ancient method. It's like a, a one of my favorite um, um, analogies. I saw a cartoon of like uh, you know you see um, a uh, um, a horse and buggy. You know, and, and and it's trying to rein in a spaceship, and the spaceship is symbolizing Earth, <laughs> and the horse and buggy is symbolizing. I, th I think it's uh, the FCC can trying to control the internet. <laughs> right. Yep. Yep. <laughs> like that's exactly. kind, of, kind of the way I see. You know, um, anything that the state does, and 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 then the, the, you know try to you know I don't know like with with Cody Wilson for example trying to take away his 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 plans his um yeah his his blueprints to three D three D print a gun you know they they try to you know you know sue him and you know steal his money and take away his ability to spread the information but guess what the information is already out there so what are you gonna do about it nothing you can't do anything about it you know the cat's out of the bag yeah. and so it yeah. just dealt it just demonstrates. Um, the complete incompetence and inadequacy of uh, of the violence of the state. Yep. Yep. Totally. Yeah. Actually, speaking of Cody Wilson, one of my favorite podcast episodes is uh, about two hours. Uh, it was really great. I just hung out with Cody Wilson, and we talked about it. It wasn't just Ghost Gunner the whole time. You know, we talked about <laughs> that. But um, but the second, actually, the second full hour was all just talking about religion, occasionalism, free will. Um, it was a really great discussion. And uh, that was up on YouTube. Um, my, my most popular interview, I think by far, and, uh, they just deleted it last week or maybe it was, yeah, just, just last week they deleted it. And, uh, they said that it was because we were trying to sell firearms on YouTube. It was against their terms of service. What? Uh, <laughs> Seriously? Yeah. Oh, it's yeah. so sad. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Totally. It is still on my podcast though. So if you search for, uh, J.W. Weatherman in any podcast catcher, it'll come up and you can still listen to it. And uh, yeah, it's never going to be deleted, right? It's going right. to be around. Um, they've right. made it a little bit more difficult to get access to. But um, but yeah, the cat's out of the bag on this stuff. It is it is it has been a slow march um, for the cypherpunk movement. Um, but the Holy Grail was always creating secure electronic cash. Um, and we now, you know, have that with Bitcoin. It is it is really amazing that they can't shut it down. I mean, they they really cannot stop it. Um, and uh, and what's what's so incredible about that is that, you know, we know that the state is funded by having a monopoly on money, being able to print money, being able to prevent individuals from creating anything that competes with it because their money is terrible, um, but they can use violence to prevent it. Bitcoin is something where it is a competing money, but they can't figure out how to shut it down. Mm. So to me, it's inevitable that something that people would actually choose because it just functions better as money. Yeah. Um, in my view, it functions far better than gold. Gold had security flaws that led to banking and central banking. Um, but Bitcoin is actually something that people would choose to use because it works better. And it gets to compete because they can't stop it from competing. 
Um, to me, that means it's inevitable that Bitcoin takes over and central banking goes away, the Federal Reserve goes away. You know, Ron Paul is not going to have to be 90 years old still trying to get the Federal Reserve to do an audit because that was never going to happen anyway. Um, they're just they're just not going to exist because people aren't going to want to use the U.S. dollar. Um, and then and then it gets really interesting from there because we know that uh, when people use cash, they very rarely pay income tax. They very rarely pay sales tax. So a digital private electronic cash, if it's just as good as paper transactions, and it's actually far better. Uh, but if it was just as good, we're already to the point where the state is almost entirely defunded. Uh, mm. Just with that one innovation. Oh, yeah. So true. You know, you know, when I think about the state in trying to control the spread of, of, um, of Bitcoin or any cryptocurrency, I think of, um, you know, somebody with a sword trying to stab in a fo in a fog or a cloud <laughs> you know, yeah. to me that demonstrates the complete um you know inadequacy and incompetence of the state in dealing with anything related to the internet <laughs> like yeah you just can't control it no matter how hard you try you shut you know you shut down the silk road and you and you got put the guy in trial ross Ulbricht, and uh and you say, you know, he did all these horrible things, put him away for multiple life sentences, and guess what? Ten more websites pop up, which is more, exp more expansive <laughs> and, yeah. and sell many more things than Silk Road ever did. Uh, and then that, that's, the, that's one of the best um, examples of, of, of why you can't, uh, you know, like playing whack-a-mole, right? <laughs> you, can't, yeah. you can never get them yep. all. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, they really only have one. Uh, they only have one trick, and that's to run around with AR-15s and kick in your front door. Right. And with encryption technology, if they can't find where you're at, if they can't find your front door, they're <laughs> it's game over for them. They really don't have any other. You know, this this whole idea that right. um, the CIA and the NSA are you know brilliant and cutting edge, and uh, you know, no matter how many Jack Ryan, uh, you know, Amazon. Uh, uh, TV shows come out. Everybody knows the brain trust is in Silicon Valley. They're not in Washington, D.C., right? <laughs> like the, the brilliant software developers are not working for the government. Um, and that that story is, you know, just doesn't make any sense. So, you know, they're they're not it's not what they're good at. It's what we're good at, actually. And uh, that's why we're going to win. Yeah, I mean, again, what's the incentive? Like, maybe, maybe you do have some some developers, um, just like you know, the state always wants to have um, the you know the intelligentsia, you know the um, the uh, the professors. They, they always want the uh, the wise people to be on their side. But again, once once they once they're taken out of the market, out of the free market, and and put into the state, you know, what's their incentive to continue to be productive? Right to continue to innovate, you know the incentive is lost, and and uh, you know exactly why people, you know the electronics industry has been such a such a wonderful thing and has exploded these past couple of decades is because you know they pretty much have no um, no barriers, right? No restrictions, no regulations as compared to other industries, right? Like automotive industry and. Um, you know, whatever, you know, let's say, let's say private schooling even, you know, has so many regulations and, and hampering that, you know, that, that, that you know, the, um, that, that's why I, I always describe, you know, the, um, the electronics industry as being one of the closest ex examples we have of a truly free market. W would you say that's accurate? Yeah, yeah, I think so. I think one of the other things that happens with software developers, and I, I, I really appreciate this about this uh, situation, is that we tend to think of the government as having unlimited power, like unlimited funding. Right? right they can right. hire, they can hire the best of the best. They can right. do whatever they want. Well, there's a there's a couple things that happen with software developers. Right. They can right. feed themselves. And so they're not they're not looking for a handout. They're not like, you know, some insurance salesman that is barely making ends meet. Um, if you're a competent software developer, you can write your own ticket. So it's going to be very hard for some government uh, agency to lure them away to work on anything that's not interesting to them mm. because they have they they have food, they have a nice house, they have the things that they want in life, and they want they enjoy solving problems. So you're going to you're going to try to get them to go work for some agency to spy on people. You're going to try to get them to come work for some agency to build software to make paying taxes 
uh, a little bit more efficient or make it harder to get away with not paying taxes. Like who wants to do that? Nobody wants to do that. And if you have the money to not, you don't. Mm. Um, so that's, that's one of the problems, uh, that they face. The other big problem that they face is that, um, even if they could, uh, they don't have the budget. Software developers are really expensive. Like we are so super empowered that we have FU money really early in our careers now. And you would have to choke us with hundred dollar bills to get us anywhere <laughs> near that place. And they just don't have the money for it. They just can't afford us. Um, so they've already lost the game just, mm. just on that angle as well. Right. Uh, so, I mean, g- Go ahead. Try to hire my son when he's 24. Good luck. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and, and the uh, the Hollywood industry is also trying very very hard to try to um, <clears throat> propagate that notion that you know the best people and the brightest people work for the state, right? You see that all the time in movies, and um, yeah, and, and you gotta you gotta kind of uh, when you watch a movie, you gotta suspend your idea of what reality is <laughs> in order to appreciate. You know, most of the mainstream movies nowadays. Um, yeah. Right. <laughs> yeah. 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 No, absolutely. It, it is. It is getting more and more absurd. It's getting more and more disconnected from reality. And uh, I think, you know, and the, the the good news is the further that the propaganda gets from reality, the less to, less effective it will be, the more absurd and, you know, just apparently stupid it will be to all of us. So they're going to have to tone it back at a certain point. But um, but, yeah, you know. The, the other thing that's happening is like the conversation that we're having, the whole media is getting so decentralized because software developers took the time to write Skype, YouTube. Yes, you know, there's censorship and there's problems with it. But look, at least we have a battlefield now, right? Mm. We didn't even have a conversation before. Like right. I would have to be trying to get on NBC or something to talk about bringing down the public schools <laughs> to end. And maybe, you know, maybe if I was on NBC and I got a four minute spot, which would be insane with four some, minutes. you know, news, it would it would cost me easily one hundred thousand dollars and I might have two or three thousand viewers. We're probably going to get that from this. Right. Like you're going to put it out. I'm going to retweet it. We'll probably get two or three thousand people to listen to this conversation. And it didn't cost us anything. Right. Uh, so it's it's definitely getting better and it's getting much harder for them to do that. Uh, independent movies, uh, I think are going to be more and more common, uh, because all of the technology that's required to, to make movies and those sort of things is more accessible as well. So, you know, soon, soon Hollywood will be, Oh, that place where people used to make movies before it was so cheap and easy, you know, that it was not necessary to have government approval to, uh, to build it. Right. <laughs> yeah, it's uh yeah, it's getting more and more comical. But um but yeah, wonderful um yeah, wonderful conversation uh JW, really appreciate it. So so please um before uh yeah, before we uh say uh, sign off, um just reiterate the uh the places where people can reach you if uh, if they want to follow your work. Yeah, so uh mathbot.com, uh just go out there, sign up, play a couple levels. You'll get you'll get a much better sense of what we're trying to do. Um, and you know, there's no charge or anything and you just, you just create an account and boom, you're playing right away. There's no, no BS. Um, so check that out. Um, you can also follow me on Twitter at JW weatherman underscore. Um, I've got my YouTube channel and podcast. They're, they're basically the same thing, but depending on which format you like, just go to either your podcast catcher or YouTube and search for JW weatherman show and it'll come right up. And, uh, yeah, all of those are, are great places to reach out. And if you guys do check out MathBot, uh, I'm always looking for feedback, what you did like, what you didn't like. Um, I need a constant stream of that because these are really, really hard problems. And uh, you'd be surprised how much it makes a difference if somebody just jumps out and says, hey, you know, I didn't know where to click. That could that can be a game changer. Uh, that can impact 500 people over the next month. So, um, uh, that's super helpful if, uh, if that's something you guys are interested in doing. Yeah, my uh, yeah. I don't know if I mentioned. Did I mention my son uh, was doing the math bot? Um, I don't know yeah. if I mentioned this here, but uh, yeah, he he loves it. Um, you know, he's he's very partial to um, logic and chess and mathematics, and so he uh, he really enjoys the programming aspect of it. And um, yeah, and and actually, I had to, uh, <laughs> you know, because we do different things when I, when I do the. Um, you know, the homeschooling time with my kids, you know, we alternate between different activities, but he didn't want to stop. <laughs> he didn't want to stop doing that. And, uh, awesome. yeah, he really did enjoy it. So, um, so yeah, looking forward to the updates and, uh, you know, seeing it improve. Um, 
And yeah, so uh, one more thing I ask my guests before uh, we sign off is, what is your favorite quote of all time? <sighs> favorite quote of all time. Um, <laughs> wow, that's not easy. Oh. Um, uh, how about uh, whatever you do the least among my brothers, you do to me? Where's that from? That's Jesus. Oh, is it? Okay. Yeah. What, whatever you do to the least. Say again. Whatever you do to the least of my brothers, you do unto me. Ah, that, that's right. a little bit of King, King James flavor in the second version I hit you with. <laughs> I threw an unto in there. <laughs> nice. Old English. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> Beautiful. I like it. I like it. Um, man of the people, right? <laughs> yeah, I mean, there's a lot of lessons. I mean, I'm, I'm not religious. I'm not Christian at all, but I certainly can recognize there's a lot of lessons that we can learn uh, from religious texts and from, you know, maybe the teachings of Jesus as well. So, um, you know, I'm not I'm not above, you know, learning from, uh, you know, religious uh, places. You know, I think we can learn from many places, right? So, so yeah, very Absolutely. cool. Um, so, yeah, awesome, uh, awesome conversation, JW. Really appreciate it. People, please follow his work and check out MathBot. I think you will be impressed and uh, it will help you to help your kids and you to appreciate math and um, and why um, um, why the math they're teaching or the, or the so-called government math that they're teaching in uh, in government schools now is, um, you know, it's more than a waste of time. It's actually counterproductive and in, in JW's uh, words, uh, diabolical. I love it. <laughs> <laughs> awesome yeah so All thanks right. a lot thanks a lot uh, JW so uh, this is Peaceful Anarchism on the Voluntary Virtues Network and theconsciousresistance.com and solpodcast.org wishing all of you have a wonderful day take care bye thank you for listening if you enjoyed this content and would like to see more of it please feel free to donate and help me interview other fascinating people you can do so through Patreon. That's patreon.com slash peaceful anarchism to help me out. A dollar a show is all I ask. If you feel so inclined to donate more, please feel free. It will only assist me in spreading the message of freedom and volunteerism that much farther and that much more efficiently. You can also donate to my Bitcoin. My Bitcoin address is in the description to my videos as well as on my website, peacefulanarchism.com. And while you're on my site, there's a donate button to donate through PayPal. If you prefer to donate through PayPal, you can do so with that. But Patreon is a little bit easier for content creators as you can set up a recurring donation if you so desire. Also, while you're on my website, peacefulanarchism.com, please feel free to sign up, enter your email address, sign up for my newsletter, and you will receive updates every time I post something, a video or an interview. I do not send out any spam. Or you can also follow me on Facebook under facebook.com slash peaceful anarchism or facebook.com slash Danilo Cuellar 3, I believe. Danilo Cuellar 3. So either, either one of those methods, if you are able to donate, I would be most appreciative. Thank you very much for listening. I hope you have a magnificent day. Cell 411 is a free app for Android and iOS that replaces government-controlled 911. Cell 411 allows you to preset a group of friends or private organizations to show up in any emergency. Cell 411 is a nightmare for the state because it proves their so-called services aren't needed. Cell 411 has had thousands of installs, and of course it's covered by the Bipcot No Government License. Cell 411 because your friends won't shoot you when you're in trouble. Without the government, who would build the emergency services? You and Cell 411. Get it today at GetCell411.com. That's GetCell411.com.